hppodcraft.com. Okay, we're rolling. We're rolling. In relating the circumstances which have led to my confinement within this refuge for the demented, I'm aware that my present position will create a natural doubt of the authenticity of my narrative. It is an unfortunate fact that the bulk of humanity is too limited in its mental vision to weigh with patience and intelligence those isolated phenomena seen and felt only by a psychologically sensitive few, which lie outside its common experience. Men of broader intellect know that there is no sharp distinction betwixt the real and the unreal, that all things appear as they do only by virtue of the delicate individual physical and mental media through which we are made conscious of them. But the prosaic materialism of the majority condemns as madness the flashes of super sight which penetrate the common veil of obvious empiricism. Testing, testing. All right. Uh, welcome to the HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. I am one of your hosts, Chris Lackey. And I'm Chad Pfeiffer here at hppodcraft.com. All right. Uh, this week we're talking about HP Lovecraft's first adult story, The Tomb. Is it a... Wait, it's actually an adult story? No, 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 no. It's not a... Uh, it's a story he wrote while he was an adult, not a story for adults. Oh, okay. I mean, I got a little excited while I was reading it, but I wasn't aware. Uh, you really got excited? By it? Yeah, I got a little excited. We'll get to that later. Okay. Uh, first, we're going to just get you up to speed. So, The Tomb. The Tomb is a tale of a young man whose name is uh, Jervis Dudley. And Jervis, ever since he was a child, has always kind of been an outsider. He, he always felt like he saw things that other people couldn't see. Specifically, uh, dryads and, and spirits. <laughs> <laughs> well, he doesn't go too into too much detail. But no, he doesn't. A, a, as he relates in the opening passage, he's clearly in some insane asylum or he's behind bars. Yes. This is a, this is a really common uh, opening for H.P. Lovecraft. You know, the, the sort of thing that says, they say I'm crazy, but I've glimpsed the truth. Mm-hmm. The truth that we don't allow ourselves to see. There's this other world the spirit haunted world out there something beyond the mundane and then he goes on to relate as a child as as chris said he frolicked around in the forest with perhaps some kind of nymphy well there were some strange things out there he dryads was, dryads are, are, are tree spirits Chad. Right. He, 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 nymphs are uh are a little bit more sensual really yeah well see the word, I mean, nympho- that's what led me to believe that maybe it go. is an adult maybe story. But, the, but they didn't say nymphs in the, there, Chad. They the said point. they said dryads. <laughs> okay, we're going to lose the plot. The point is, okay, this, I'm sorry. as a young lad, he used to go out in the woods by his house. He, he kind of lived his life out there. He didn't go to school because he had certain... He just had problems with other kids, so he didn't really want to attend. Well, they couldn't see the things that he saw. Right, exactly. Yeah. He just he was a sensitive kid. And Very because sensitive. of this sensitivity, he could behold things in the world that maybe the rest of us didn't see. Eventually, this kid finds a tomb. Yes, out in the woods. One day, he's frolicking in this uh, this tomb. It's it's very old, and it has a big chain and a huge padlock on there, but the door is slightly ajar, and it, it, it piques his curiosity, and he tries to get inside, but he can't because he's only 10, so he doesn't have the strength to break the chain. Right, and he's really infuriated by this. I mean, he really wants to get inside of this tomb for whatever reason. It's embedded in the side of a hill, and he makes some discreet inquiries around town and finds out that there actually used to be this... Uh, mansion that was on the grounds that an ancient family, the Hyde family, the Hyde family used to live in, uh, but because of some calamity, we're not sure what it is yet, it burned to the ground. Yes. Uh, so the the mansion isn't there anymore, although some of its relics are around, and the only thing that really remains, the only structure, is this tomb that he just cannot get into. So he decides, um, after reading Plutarch's Lives, that he is going to uh, wait until adulthood to tackle this problem. And if there is a sort of psychosexual undercurrent going on in here. That- Mm-hmm. There it is. When he reads this, he says, I want to penetrate that tomb. I want to get in there. But, uh, you know, maybe uh, I have wow. I, I didn't get that at all. Okay. That's not something that even remotely crossed my mind. Look, man, mind. you said it was an adult story. I, he, no, I, yes, I did okay. say that, but that's not what I... Well, discerning readers will get that, and the rest of you can just enjoy the pulp. Uh, moving on, he basically sits in front of that tomb and listens at the tomb and hears voices, and he begins... Uh, his parents notice that he's speaking in old dialects and using uh, uh, antiquated vernacular. Yeah, it's really strange. He's been basically sleeping out there by that open door yes. and just keeping his ear up against it, and it's having strange impact on him that nobody can explain. Yes, and he's been keeping this quiet, and, and nobody supposedly knows that he's going out there, he's sneaking off and doing this. Now, one uh, one night, he, when he's a little older, he falls asleep at the door, and when he wakes up, he discerns just a little bit of light on the inside. Almost, I imagine it was almost like a flashlight just passed by the door, but maybe, you know, could have been a lantern, could have been something phosphorescent he's not sure quickly diminishes Mm -hmm. and he wanders back home and he goes home and he feels um, called to go up to the attic of the house he goes to the attic and finds a box and in the box there's a key right and with that key he returns to the tomb because it's finally time he's yeah he's an adult he's like 20 i think yeah and he unlocks the door and he goes in goes down some stairs yeah he goes down some stairs comes across a box the name on the box makes him smile Uh uh-huh he climbs in and he goes to sleep 
Yeah. An odd impulse caused me to climb upon the broad slab, extinguish my candle, and lie down within the vacant box. Pretty creepy. Very creepy. He likes it. He doesn't seem scared, but he, he spends the night in that box. And uh, is that the passage when he when he walks home, he just seems sort of elated and happy? Well, yeah. I mean, he, he also develops a, f- a fear of thunderstorms. Oh, right. Like after he starts sleeping in that yeah, box. He suddenly. sleeps in the box night after night, and he just kind of makes it his home, and, and he... He, he's having these experiences, like uh, he's getting transported uh, back in time to this uh, to this manor, uh, this mansion. Uh, w- one of the times when he's going back, he, he sees that the manor is intact. It's not it's not just burned out anymore. And there's a party going on, and he uh, you know in, it gets involved in like a drunken revelry. And, right. Yeah. yeah. Totally unexpected. He goes back for his normal time at the tomb. Secretive. He's always secretive. Yeah. About it's very stuff secretive. He doesn't want anybody to know. And uh, and everything's there suddenly. He doesn't say exactly what goes on, but it's some drunken revelry, and yeah. uh, he kind of specifically avoids details of what happens. But he's implying that there's probably some, you know, lots of booze and sex and dirty yeah, jokes and exactly. whatever. Lots of dirty jokes. And I want to read this passage. Inside the hall were, <clears throat> inside the hall were music, laughter, and wine on every hand. Several faces I recognized, though I should have known them better had they been shriveled or eaten away by death and decomposition. Amidst a wild and reckless throng, I was the wildest and most abandoned. Gay blasphemy poured in torrents from my lips, and in shocking sallies I heeded no law of God or nature. Yeah. That is a serious party, man. Yeah, that is, that's, that's rocking. Gay blasphemy poured in torrents from my lips, and in shocking sallies I heeded no law of God or nature. That's like Motley Crue kind of stuff. That's absolutely No, Ozzy I take that Osborne. back. That's Ozzy Osbourne. That's Ozzy Osbourne snorting some ants, ants off the side of off the, the side. sidewalk. Yeah, that is some crazy that's good it. stuff. I yeah. love it. And uh, he then uh, parties himself out, you know. Oh no! Well, they're all partying. Oh, yeah, that, that right. And then yeah. that's when the lightning. That's strikes. when the lightning strikes. So it's almost, uh, you know, he's he's back in time with these people having fun, and then the lightning strikes burns the entire structure to the ground, along with most of the people there. And I think that even and, and he himself, yeah, he feels he, is, yeah, he yeah. feels himself burn up, and then as but it, he, as he's burning himself up, he freaks out and kind of comes to. And he's being held by two men, and his father's there, and and his father tells him, you're having a psychotic episode. So the lightning really did strike, though. It did. And it actually uncovered in the in the floor, because he's not in the tomb when he's dancing around. He's no. actually out on the old grounds of the mansion. And uh, when it strikes, it cracks through the cellar floor, and the villagers from his village, who are all obviously out there because he's freaking out in the middle of the woods. Right. Um, and lightning struck. And lightning struck. Yeah. Uh, they open this box that's within, and there's all kinds of crazy stuff in there, but the one thing that our protagonist is interested in in is a small bust, a small statue of a man who looks exactly like him. It looks just like him, yeah. But it's obviously much older, so he didn't put it there. It was right. there from before. And the initials are J.H. Right. Uh, so then, um, he seems pretty upset and freaked out by that, and his father puts him in the mental institution. And there he stays freaked out and upset, but he convinces Hiram, his servant, who has always been faithful to him, he says, please go go to the, to the tomb and see what's inside. And so Hiram goes there, busts open the lock, gets inside. Uh, he goes into the tomb and finds that, that box that he was sleeping in, that mm-hmm. alcove. And it says on the name, there's a plate that reads Jervis. Jervis Hyde. Jervis Hyde. Yes. So, all this time, and that's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. And the the discovery is, is is it's almost as if he's lived before. Before, like he's some sort of reincarnation, or it's a distant relative. Or, that's right. Uh, which is a pretty common theme with with Lovecraft. And in fact, this this idea kind of later pops up as part of the story of the case of Charles Dexter Ward. What pops up that there's an ancestor? There's an ancestor that. Bears a striking resemblance to the living person. And then eventually in some way takes over their life. Yes. Now, I, in, in one of the books that I've, um, I'm reading uh, is Kenneth Heights' Tour de Lovecraft. It references this story and, and it points out that this is kind of a precursor to, to the case of Charles Dexter Ward. Uh, Kenneth Height kind of, I, I think he's a little harsh on this story and, mm-hmm. think, and thinks that the uh, case of Charles Dexter Ward is a better told version of this same story. But I mm-hmm. think these, the two stories are very different. Well, Charles Dexter Ward's also a novelette, and this is just a short little piece. Yes. The cleansing lightning blast, common in Lovecraft stories, uh, specifically lurking fear and haunter in the dark. In this story, they were being, you know, uh, hedonistic uh, revelers. Revelers? Revelers. Yeah. And uh, the lightning hits, and hey, God or the forces of nature say, 
that's wrong. I'm going to burn all these people to a crisp. It's funny, you know, when you say that now, um, it makes me think that the lightning bolt was what burned everybody alive, presumably, back in the day. Yes. Mm-hmm. And then it strikes again when he is reliving it. Yeah. And shows him, it, what it reveals to him, that lightning blast, is an image of himself. And it's almost as if it's, it's another moralistic thing. If you continue down this path, yes, you will, this you will, will end up you. like them. Yeah. Well, what, how did this story come about? I know that, so it was written, or it was published, rather, in 1922 in The Vagrant. That's, That's right, and later, and Weird Tales, again, a few years later. But it was written, actually, in 1917, which oh, okay. was what was going on in his life. He was... Uh, he was 27 years old. Yeah, that's right. His This is before his mother became institutionalized herself for going insane. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, I think he was pretty happy at this point in his life. I mean, he'd had many years to get over his grandfather's death. And he was very involved in correspondence and letters right. and, and magazines. And he was encouraged to start writing these stories and submitting them uh, for publication. So this is kind of his grown-up you know, leap into being... A professional writer. And and what was the inspiration for this story in particular? Uh, according to the H.P. Lovecraft scholar, S.T. Uh, jo- jo- Joshi, he was walking with his Aunt Lillian Clark uh, through Swan Point Cemetery. And he looked at one of, a gra- uh, one of the gravestones there, and it was dated 1711. And it was a distant ancestor of his aunt's. And he thought to himself, why could I not talk with him and enter more intimately into the life of my chosen age? What had left his body that it could no longer converse with me? I looked long at the grave, and the night after I returned home, I began my first story of a new series, The Tomb. And that was from a letter that he had written to hmm. a friend of his. Uh, so that's the background of the story. What about, um, I think you were saying earlier that somebody criticized this as being an imitation of Poe, of Edgar Allan Poe's story. Yeah, that's another uh, thing that Mr. Hyde, Hyde, uh, Hyde, Kenneth Hyde said in, in his book, Tour de Lovecraft, which is a very good book. Uh, is that he thinks this is a Poe wannabe story, and it's kind of his first foyer in professional writing, and of course he was influenced heavily by Poe, but I personally, the only thing I see similar to this and Poe is that they're kind of creepy, scary stories. You know, I think a lot of writers start by imitating the the people that they admire, and and there is one thing that Poe Poe did that, that Lovecraft does here is he sort of... He, he his opening paragraph is a sort of dissertation on some specific psychological phenomena or um, a, a, creates a greater mood before he jumps into the story right something that Poe often did you know Poe was a very romantic writer and, and had very sensitive characters who all, often had conditions that kept them from getting involved in society and mm-hmm. so it is similar in those respects there is a small buried alive story in here which I found really creepy and interesting I would sometimes rise very quietly in the night stealing out to walk in those churchyards and places of burial from which I had been kept by my parents what I did there I may not say for I am not now sure of the reality of certain things but I know that on the day after such a nocturnal ramble I would often astonish those about me with my knowledge of topics almost forgotten for many generations it was after a night like this that I shocked the community with a queer conceit about the burial of the rich and celebrated Squire Brewster, a maker of local history who was interred in 1711, and whose slate headstone bearing a graven skull and crossbones was slowly crumbling to powder. In a moment of childish imagination, I vowed not only that the undertaker, Goodman Simpson, had stolen the silver buckled shoes, silken hose, and satin small clothes of the deceased before burial, but that the squire himself, not fully inanimate, had turned twice in his mound-covered coffin on the day after interment. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I imagine if you're, you know, what is he, 12-year-old kid comes home and, and tells this crazy buried alive story. Right, right, right. You know, the, I have personal facts that this guy not only grave robbed, but the guy wasn't even dead. And it sort of implies that maybe they buried him alive just so they could get his stuff. Oh, jeez. I, that was an implication I didn't it, get. But did you notice the year on that? On that 1711. 1711. I didn't until you just pointed it out to me. Look at that. Uh, yeah, that is, that is. I didn't quite understand that when I first read it. Like I, that, you pointed out to me that w- the fact that he turned over twice in there uh, yeah. obviously it means that the guy was buried alive. <laughs> and now I do feel I do see now I do see a, a better connection to uh, to Poe. Now, when Lovecraft describes uh, his protagonist in here, Jervis Dudley, mm-hmm. uh, it seems a bit autobiographical to me. I I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I think uh, many scholars also agree with you. Right, and, and now I don't know if Lovecraft was out frolicking with. Wood nymphs when he was a kid. I, I, I doubt that. But all of the facts of, of the protagonist's young life kind of line up 
They he, do. Be, he, you know, he couldn't go to school. He had trouble getting along with other he children. Had along with others, yeah. Because he saw things that those those children couldn't. Right. Exactly. And this is something else. This is a, another a facet of that is that he becomes enamored with a time before. It's not about what's going on now. It's what happened before, and he he gets engrossed in that world. Now this character gets engrossed in that world supernaturally. You know, through, through mm-hmm. talking with spirits and dryads, uh, <clears throat> but. You know, this tells a lot about Lovecraft himself. Yeah, it it almost kind of made me sad when I was thinking about it today because it expresses something, and this gets expressed a lot, that he seems as if he would have been happier had he been born in another time. Yeah. Had he been born a couple centuries or even just a century earlier. And there is a passage, and it's similar to the one I just read, and I'm not going to read it now, but he comes in and he thrills everybody with this drinking song. Yeah. Uh, it's an 18th century Bacchanalian mirth. Uh, Mm -hmm. A bit of Georgian playfulness never recorded in a book, he says. Mm -hmm. So there's no way that he as a child could have read this. He just suddenly knows it. Right. And he comes in and he sings this song. And it really is just about getting drunk and living for the moment. Yeah. And it's about, yeah, enjoying your life uh, and, and, uh, which... H.P. Lovecraft really doesn't seem like the kind of person that would, you know, partake in a drinking song. Right, and much like his protagonist, the reason that they're so surprised is because he's this kid who keeps to himself and who's a very sober, has a very sober personage, and then he busts out with this drinking song, and it it kind of makes me feel that Lovecraft, at yeah. least the protagonist in the story, felt, God, if I could have lived in that other time, I could be doing this. I would be this person. Yeah. I don't know, that to me connects to, uh, I don't know, just people you meet, or why people will get obsessed with another period in time, or why they'll feel that they would rather live in maybe uh, the fantasy. Well, we talked in the last podcast about people who maybe watch, I said Quantum Leap, I don't know how many <laughs> devotees of Quantum Leap there are out there who are writing fan fiction, but you know, it's why people will get obsessed with right. fantasy worlds, and because they don't quite fit in now, they think maybe I would fit in in this alternate reality or this other time. And also that, uh, that drinking song uh, was written before the story. He had written that uh, years earlier, and it was a, it was a poem called Gaudiamus. And he rewrote it. It was a response to somebody else that had written a poem that he thought was crappy. And so, oh, really? so he wrote his own version of it, which is this drinking song. And this was found in one of his earlier letters, and it was not never sent to anybody. Yeah, he wrote a lot of verse in his letters. Yeah. And uh, I, I mean, I know he published some as well. And he actually, you know, he was a cheery guy when he was writing this kind of thing. Yeah. You know, he has a lot of Christmas poems. He's a big fan of that holiday. Right. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll get into some of that when we run out of stories. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is, you know, this is the kind of the jumping off point for Lovecraft. This is his first real story. And common themes that are in this story that, you know, we see again later are dream worlds and questing. You know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of people going to sleep and then going to another place and getting mm-hmm. information that you would normally be able to get. Also, history tied to the present. Things that happened in the past that are affecting what's going on right now still. Uh, and also cursed family lines. That is another yeah. common thing where... So that, specifically, the history tied to the present and the cursed family lines, uh, I love that. <laughs> but, well, you know, it is a specific kind of horror, and maybe this is too simplistic, but it's the horror of becoming your parents. It's the horror of having a family trait that nothing you can do will escape it. You can go and change and be, you know, build yourself into whatever kind of person you are, but there are certain things in your family that you'll never be able to escape, and some of them you don't know what they are until you grow up. Right. And you, you don't have that perspective, of course, until you're older. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I, I think that almost anybody could say, like, oh my, I can't believe that I'm acting just like my father. I can't believe that... And even in some very physical ways, uh, recessive genes, uh, illnesses that get passed down. Right. I mean, things that you can't escape, but particularly emotional damage, right, that gets that happens earlier in a, maybe in a family's life yeah. that somehow gets passed down generation after generation. I know that, you know, among people who are addicts, some of them are shocked to find out that it's something that's been going on in their family for a long time or it's part of their history. Yeah. And, and maybe not until they confront what's going on with them will they realize, oh, my God, I'm repeating a pattern that's been going on time and time and again. Yeah. It's never a good thing when somebody finds out that they're actually... Oh, yeah. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Not at all. I mean, and this is this is kind of the difference, though. Because this is... In this story, the char- the main... The protagonist is enlightened. Whereas later in Lovecraft stories, the protagonists are generally... When they, when they are enlightened, it is detrimental to them. They lose right. their mind. They go crazy. This character uh, finds, like, kind of a, a bliss, uh, sort of an awakening. And when he... When he finally goes into that tomb and lays, you know, lays in that coffin, uh, he comes out and he says, "I'm a man now. I've, I've, I've left childhood behind. I've become, mm-hmm. I've transformed into this thing," which is very different from all other Lovecraft stories. All these experiences generally are, are he enjoys them. Like he, he enjoys going out to this party and right. you know this 
this ghost party or whatever it is that he goes like he gets he gets a, <laughs> he gets a lot out of it. By the way, ghost party was the other title for this story. That was that was the subtitle. That was rejected the, by the vagrant. I the, the ghost party would have been ghost monster monster bash. Now you did say monster bash. That would have been a good one. That would have been a great one. Ghost. Ghost Disco. Ghost Ghost Disco. Ghost Disco. Ghost Disco. But you did say that once he... I think I got from what you just said that once he penetrated the tomb, he became a man. I Something like I that. I did say that. I yes, guess I did. So yeah. There you go. <clears throat> Adult fiction, ladies and gentlemen. Adult. So I've got some uh, some passages here. Sure, yeah. I was going to just... They're well, short. Sure. I was going to read them and, and then we could talk about them a little bit. Yeah. Uh, this sentence creeps me the F out. Mm-hmm. I have said that I dwelt apart from the visible world, but I have not said that I dwelt alone. This no human creature may do, for, lacking the fellowship of the living, he inevitably draws upon the companionship of things that are not, or are no longer, living. Mm. Yeah, that's pretty good. Now, I can understand somebody saying, you know, we all need companionship. And if you don't get it, you'll seek it out maybe in some inanimate object. Sort of like uh, Tom Hanks in in Castaway, you know, has a relationship with a volleyball. Uh Uh-huh, sure. But it's it's the little... Note uh, of things that are not or are no longer are no longer living. living. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I think this plays into the, the supernatural. If you read between the lines, he is talking to ghosts, like he's communing with spirits of the dead. Right. But I think that also on on the you know the more uh, realistic parallel is that people, like you said, Tom Hanks would find this object and get into yeah. it, or you know he would read old books and those right. you know those are you know the the dead are speaking in these things and and i think lovecraft himself would retreat to these worlds because... and i think that that's yeah absolutely in one sense it means that it's just reconnecting with past with people who seem to maybe they would have understood you more people yeah. from past times mm-hmm. but it also just suggests that literally He's befriending dead things. Yeah. And to me, that is... That's pretty creepy. Really creepy. That's creepy. <laughs> Good creeping. These kind of sentences just crack me up. Uh, All day I had been wandering through the mystic groves of the hollow, thinking thoughts I need not discuss, and conversing with things I need not name. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's pretty... That's uh... It's anti-description. Yeah, but in the fact that he's not describing it, it, it leads your imagination to kind of, you know, fill in the blanks. <laughs> but it's like, you could do that with, I mean, it makes anything creepy to not name it or not speak it. You could say, you know, this morning I had a breakfast, I must not speak it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you could say that with almost anything. <laughs> I must not repeat what my mother said on the phone this morning. Yeah, that's, but it it does make it creepy. And that's, yeah. that's cool. That's very Lovecraft. I know. Yeah. I think it's a, it's a genius writing technique that I must not speak about any longer. I'm a big fan of passages like this. Mumbled tales of the weird rites and godless revels of bygone years in the ancient hall gave to me a new and potent interest in the tomb, before whose door I would sit for hours at a time each day. It's the, um, the mumbled tales of the weird rites and godless revels. Like, I try to imagine what that conversation is like. Mumbled tales? Yeah. Like, hey, Grandpa, can... <laughs> Can you tell me what might have happened out in the woods? Hey, what's happening? What's that? I can't understand. <laughs> Grandfather, you're scaring me. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of scary. <laughs> what's he saying? Those tales are mumbled. All I got from that grandfather were godless rebels. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, here's another great passage. Okay, okay. I began to feel that the tomb was mine and to look forward with hot eagerness to the time when I might pass within that stone door and down those slimy stone steps in the dark. <laughs> oh, oh, God. <laughs> now, yeah, okay. All right. Uh, you know, I know that it's very chic to inject, you know, sexuality Sex. into everything, but sure. I'm just saying there's a little bit. Now, I, and I also would say that if you're ever, if you're out in the park or you're just walking down the street and you see a creep and you wonder what he's thinking, uh-huh. that's what he's <laughs> thinking. Right there. <laughs> Because that, that is possibly the creepiest. Somebody who's uh, he's looking forward with hot eagerness to climb down some slimy stone steps. <laughs> hot eagerness. Oh, hot eagerness. Oh, those stairs are slimy. <laughs> oh, God. I'm going to just give this a little read. I will tell only of the lone tomb in the darkness of the hillside thickets. Yes. Yeah, you remember that? That's, uh, I believe, a Canadian Lovecraft-themed rock band. That's correct. The Darkest of the Hillside Thickets is a Canadian rock band. They, I think they come out in costumes, and they play all, most of their songs are about H.P. Lovecraft. It sounds familiar, Chad. I know. I had a band like that, but I don't think we're quite as successful as these guys. In fact, I think they got a song on Rock Band. 
Oh, sh- yeah. wow. Yeah, that's hit, great. It's just another example of uh, Lovecraft's yeah. Yeah, influence, influence on, on pop culture. Speaking of which, uh, now you may think, gosh, this five-page story might be hard to read. I should go out and see if there's a film adaptation. Oh, uh, yeah. There's not. However, there is a movie called H.P. Lovecraft's The Tomb. There is. Uh, came out straight to video last year, and it's a really bad Saw ripoff. That has nothing to do with And, this Chad, you, you're saying this from personal experience? I did not see the film, eh? but I read the synopsis, and it was about a man called the Puppet Master. Okay. Who tortures people in a basement tomb. Hmm. So, you know what? I should give it a watch. Maybe they just needed the title and the author's name to get it sold, which, as filmmakers, Chris and I could certainly understand. That happens. That <laughs> so, happens. So, hey, I, I don't mean to make anybody mad out there if you are a fan of the movie or you were involved. Uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen it, but it, it on principle, it annoys the hell out of me. Yeah, and I, you know. Yeah. Hopefully, I, we're going to be a little bit more critical of other stories of Lovecraft, because some of them I don't like as much as others. Mm-hmm. And I know that this is our first uh, our first discussion of, of the story, but I, I really like the story. Yeah, and, I really like it. And um, I actually think that it's a great introduction to the man's work. Yeah. One thing that I want to mention is, uh, if, and, and we might have mentioned it last time, if you want to read any of these stories for free, they're available online. Uh, there's a site called DagonBytes.com, D-A-G-O-N-B-Y-T-E-S.com. And also there are a number of podcasts uh, that, besides our own that uh, just have people reading uh, specific stories. Another podcast that I really do enjoy is called Yog Sothoth, uh, their podcast. Yeah, YogSothoth.com. Dot com, and uh, they primarily talk about the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, but they definitely you know talk about Lovecraft in general. So it's a really good podcast. I recommend it. Check it out. And no reason not to plug our own stuff Uh, Chris and I are both filmmakers we put out a film last year that is uh, not Lovecraftian but it's still a hoot it's a feature animated independent comedy called The Chosen One Yes. stars Tim Curry uh, Tracy Lords, Laura Perpon from that 70s show Daniel Fischel who's now on uh, The Dish The Dish uh, myself, Chris directed it and animated it almost entirely. It is himself. an animated feature film, uh, and we we kind of did the whole thing ourselves. It came out straight to video last year, and you can pick it up at any fine online video retailer at our site, www.thechosenonemovie.com. In Lovecraftian Entertainment, we were both also involved in the film adaptation of The Call of Cthulhu, yes, which came out around uh, 2005. It was a festival darling, won Best American Feature at the Avignon Film Festival. Yes, uh, it's a silent film adaptation of. The story, The Call of Cthulhu. That's right. And it and it's also available online. And... Yeah, you can uh, rent it. It's the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, and their website is CthulhuLives.org. That's right. Or you could just do a search on H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society, because that's yes. a hard one to spell. Yeah. Next week, we have the story uh, Dagon. Oh, cool. that is the next story. And Dagon. Dagon it definitely steps into the Lovecraftian mythos. And, right. Yeah. We're, you know, What's that about? Uh, Dagon is, I think it's about a guy who makes sandwiches. Well, actually, why don't you tune in next week to, uh, to find out about, uh, find uh, out there's what something about. fishy about this There story, is something, I'd say. There's, <laughs> there's something fishy about. <laughs> All right, about signing Dagon. off. I'm Chad Pfeiffer. And I'm Chris Lackey. And this is HPPodcraft.com. The HP Lovecraft Literary Podcast. We got it right this time. Woohoo! See you next time. Bye-bye. HPPodcraft.com. Ah.